Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last lecture of guitar amplification and effects, we looked at transformers. And in the lecture before that, we started to look at single-ended power amplifiers. In particular, we looked at bias schemes for such circuits. In this lecture, we'll do some large signal analysis, and we'll do some small signal analysis in the next lecture. This is the opposite order of what we did for common cathode preamplifier stages, where we first did a small signal analysis and then did a large signal analysis. But for power amplifiers, the larger signal analysis is really more pertinent because it determines how much power you can deliver to the speaker. But the small signal analysis does provide some insight, so we'll look at that next time. We've been looking at the Fender Champ, in particular model 5E1. It consists of two capacitively coupled preamp stages that have a volume control in between, and they're identical except the first stage is fully bypassed and the second stage isn't bypassed at all. There is some feedback from the output transformer back to the second stage. This is fairly complicated to think about, so I'll save that for a future lecture. As far as this series of lecture goes, we'll ignore it. The power supply is down here. We have the power transformer, the tube rectifier, and the death capacitor, along with a dangerous non-grounded two-pin plug. The schematic is a little awkward to read because the power supply for the plates of the tubes is actually down here instead of up at the top of the schematic where we usually draw it. And focusing in on the power amplifier, we see that it is capacitively coupled to the previous stage. And we have a 220K grid leak resistor, a 470 ohm cathode resistor, which is bypassed by a 25 microfarad capacitor. And the speaker is driven by this transformer. That's something we looked at last time. Redrawing this common cathode amplifier in terms of its DC bias and small signal circuits, remember that the transformer can't pass DC. So this essentially looks like a short at DC, so it doesn't play a role in the biasing. If you haven't seen my lecture about the biasing, you can keep watching this lecture. I'll review the results of that lecture when they're needed, but you'll want to go back and watch that. In that lecture, we discovered that the plate to cathode and screen to cathode voltage are both 286 volts. I want to emphasize that it's not always the case that these quantities are the same. Sometimes the screen to cathode voltage will be a little less than the plate to cathode voltage. The grid to cathode voltage is easily determined to be minus 19 volts. The current through the cathode turns out to be 40 milliamps, and that's split between the plate and the screen. The current through the plate is actually 37 milliamps, and the current through the screen is then obviously 3 milliamps. So we ended the lecture on biasing by looking at this cursor from the 6v6 datasheet from General Electric. The things we want to focus on here are the solid lines that show the plate current versus plate voltage for a variety of grid to cathode voltages. And by grid to cathode voltage, I mean the control grid that's analogous to the original grid in the triodes. This set of curves is different than what we saw for the 12AX7 and other small signal triodes and that it shows what happens for positive grid to cathode voltages. But remember, we don't want to operate in that region. Because if the grid to cathode voltage is positive, current flows through the grid, and that's a bad thing. That's shown by the dashed lines, but again, we don't want to operate in that region. Now, normally to do a large signal analysis, we would want to plot the bias point and then draw an AC load line and see where that AC load line intercepts this grid to cathode equals zero voltage line. And that would determine how far we could swing to the left. But something strange happens if we try to plot the bias quantities on this graph. We have a plate to cathode voltage of 286 volts. And if we were to plot the plate bias current of 37 milliamps, 
that winds up intersecting the grid to cathode voltage line of minus 15 volts, but we know it should be closer to something down here because it's minus 19. Whereas if we imagine a minus 19 volt grid to cathode voltage line, intersect it with this 286 volt line, and then draw a line to the left from there, we get something more like 20 milliamps. And we know that our plate current should be 37 milliamps. So there's an inconsistency here. So we should be suspicious of these results. The main problem arises in the fact that this graph is only really valid for a screen to cathode voltage of 250 volts, but our actual screen to cathode voltage is 286 volts. Now, the manufacturers could provide a series of graphs like this for different screen to cathode voltages, but that would make for a really long data sheet. And after all, the main grid to cathode line we're actually interested in is this grid to cathode equals zero volt line. So since this is the main thing we need to focus in on, manufacturers will provide a set of curves for the zero volt grid to cathode case for a variety of screen to cathode voltages. But we still have a problem with this chart because we have a line for 250 volts, but we don't have a line for 286 volts. And our whole reason for going to a plot like this was that we were having issues getting these plots at 250 volts for our screen to cathode voltage to match up. But there's a trick that we could use to extrapolate these kinds of graphs to create the kind of curve that we're looking for. I first saw this trick in Richard Kono's first book on the Fender Baseman, and the trick also shows up in his book on power amplifiers. It's based on this weird formula that's reminiscent of an early formula I presented for triodes, and this formula has to do with the screen to cathode voltage, the grid to cathode voltage, the current flowing through the cathode, and this parameter mu sub s. Don't get this parameter confused with the mu parameter associated with the control grid. There is a constant here that I call k prime because the way it's set up here, it's a little bit different in terms of the role this constant plays than the k I had in the triode formula. Now, you can use some various graphs and other bits of information on the data sheet to estimate what mu s is and create a set of curves for different GK values. But we're really only interested in the VGK equals zero line. So that goes away. And I wind up with IK equals VSK to the three halves power times some constant. That's basically K prime times this one over mu S to the three halves power. So I can rearrange this expression by dividing both sides by VSK to the 1.5 and essentially get it in the form that I have a constant on the right. And this constant is going to stay constant. Okay, I guess that wasn't a very insightful thing for me to say. Anyway, I can plug in different IKs and different VSKs and equate them with each other. I can do something like this. I can plug in 286 on one side, 250 on the other side, we know what the current is supposed to be for a screen to cathode voltage of 250, and we can use that to find what it would be for 286 volts. I can just multiply both sides by 286 to the 3 halves power, giving me an expression that looks like this. Now, we're not really interested in the cathode voltage on the plots, we're interested in the plate voltage. So I'm going to make a particular assumption I'm going to assume that the plate current and the screen current scale equally. That is an assumption. But making that assumption, I can replace the k's in this expression with p's. And computing this out, I get 1.22. So I read a bunch of points off the plot. Basically, I picked points where it looked like the 250 volt screen to cathode line lined up nicely with some of the grid lines, so it would be easy to read the results. And then I put all of that information into an Excel spreadsheet. So this is what I read off the graph. And then I multiplied each of these numbers by 1.22 to get this number here. And then I took these points and plot them on the graph to come up with the green line that you see here. 
and we have a line associated with 286 volts. So as an aside, in previous lectures when I said the screen to cathode voltage was the same as or less than the plate to cathode voltage, I should have emphasized that's referring to the DC bias points. The plate to cathode voltage itself of course swings around all over the place. That's how we get an amplifier. So now to draw an AC load line, what I would want to do is find a point on the vertical axis here, find a current point to plot associated with traversing 286 volts this direction. What I want to know is for that amount of voltage swing, how much of a difference in current would I get associated with the load impedance? So for that point on the vertical axis, we start at the bias current of 37 milliamps. We traverse 286 volts to the left, and by Ohm's law, I'll divide that by the 8.2 kilo ohm impedance, which is what we're assuming we see on the primary side that's reflected from the 4 ohm speaker through the transformer. That's something we looked at in the last lecture. Okay, so I can plot that 72 milliamp point here, draw a line connecting it and the bias point. And of course, the whole point of this exercise is we can't actually swing all the way to the vertical axis here. We need to stop at the VGK equals zero line for a screen to cathode voltage of 286 volts as indicated by the screen line. So if I take the intersection of the green line and the blue line and project that down, I see that we can swing down to a plate to cathode voltage of 15 volts. Now, all of the work I did to extrapolate this graph may have been a bit of overkill because although they're very different over here, they slope down so quickly over here, I probably could have just used this line here and estimated based on that and gotten more or less the same answer. But I didn't know until I tried. So I have a maximum voltage swing to the left of 271 volts. What about the swing to the right? Well, I could start from the DC bias point, travel 37 milliamps down, and if I did that, we would be traveling to the right by 37 milliamps times 8.2 kilo ohms, which is 303 volts. So that would put us out here somewhere. But I didn't bother to draw that plot going this direction because after all, the swing to the left is the dominant factor here. And in fact, that's the case for every power amplifier stage I've looked at. The limiting factor is always the grid voltage and not the place where you run out of current. Okay, so we swing to the left by 271 volts. Over that swing, we're changing the grid to cathode voltage by 19 volts. So our large signal voltage gain is 271 over 19 or 14. Now, this is not actually that interesting of a number because the entire point of this is to create current to drive the speaker coil, not necessarily provide voltage gain. And I want to emphasize this is the voltage gain on the tube side. If you divide this by the turns ratio of the transformer, you'll see the voltage gain at the speaker side is actually very small. But again, the whole point of this the whole point of the transformer is to match the impedances so you get maximum power transfer. And let's see just how much power the speaker gets. So the left swing is 271 volts. That gives us a max voltage on the tube side, but we need to divide that by the turns ratio of the transformer, which in the previous lecture we determined was 45.3 to give us the actual max voltage on the speaker side of six volts. So if I take six volts and I square that and divide it by four to get a power figure, I get nine watts. And that's higher than what's published for Fender Champ. But remember that this is for a maximum value and the power is usually reported as an RMS value, a root mean squared value. So Let's assume that we're inputting a sine wave. 
then basically I would take the 6 here and want to divide it by square root of 2 to get an RMS value. Well, if I square that 1 over square root of 2, that's equivalent to taking this and dividing it by 2, which would give me an RMS power value of 4.5 watts. And let's take a look here. The published power spec of a Fender Champ is indeed 5 watts, so we're in the ballpark. Now, I can compute this power a different way. We know that power is conserved across the transformer, so I could just compute the power on the tube side. So I would have 271 volts squared divided by the impedance seen on the tube side, which is 8.2 kilo ohms, which gives me 9 watts. I divide that by 2 and I get 4.5. So I didn't necessarily need to compute this turns ratio in the previous lecture to do this computation, but I think there is some insight gained into seeing this computation done on the speaker side. Now, before we close out, I want to address that little voice in the back of your head that was telling you that there's something strange going on the moment I presented this plot. We put the bias point here at 286 volts, and we said that we could swing 271 volts to the left. Well, then we could also swing 271 volts to the right. And if I were to draw that line going this direction, wait a minute, the power supply was 306 volts. I'm claiming we can get plate voltages that are higher than the power supply. How can that be? That's certainly not something we saw with the resistive loads that we had with the common cathode preamplifier stages we've looked at previously. The key is to remember that the speaker is a reactive load dominated by inductance. So it can store energy in a magnetic field and then spit it back out towards the amplifier. Kind of like a spark plug, but less sparky.